of that process. Richard Wolf, I want to thank you for being with us. Professor of Economics Emeritus, University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor at the University, host of the weekly program, Economic Update. And uh, we'll link to your writings and work. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman in New York with Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Thanks for joining us. The viewpoints expressed in this program are the opinions of the people expressing them and are not necessarily those of Fresh Air Incorporated, its staff, or its board of directors. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along today as well. And today we want to focus on a, a very special project uh, coming online in a few days. This is Black History Month. We're on the eve of Black History Month uh, today, uh, Tuesday, August, excuse me, Tuesday, January 31st, uh, a day out, an eve out from Black History Month. And I've got a special guest who's doing a musical tribute to the uh, gospel music tradition. Reverend William Pierce is going to be here momentarily. I want to begin, though, with uh, inviting you to, uh, as I always do, join, support this program, this work, support the conversations with Al McFarland. It's simple. Uh, go to our YouTube channel, The Conversation with Al McFarland on the Insight News YouTube channel, and subscribe. Subscribe and share and like. We want to grow our subscriber base from around you know, less than 300 now to 1,000. And so the particular specific ask, I have a view right now, all of my friends and uh, followers out uh, and listeners here on KFAI and on the other platforms is when you get a minute, take a minute now if you can and go to YouTube Insight News and subscribe to The Conversation with Al McFarland. We're going to begin today's program, uh, as we have of late, with uh, hot topics. And the item I have in mind for hot topics today, there are two. Uh, one has to do with the, the success of uh, Senator Bobby Joe Champion and others at the state of Minnesota signing the Crown Act and sending that bill to Governor uh, Tim Walz's desk. Uh, Bobby Champion tweeted this morning uh, that he signed the enrollment of the Crown Act or for the Crown Act to send the bill to Governor's desk. He said he was grateful for the hard work of, uh, uh, of Representative Esther Agbaje. Uh, and uh, he said that, in fact, this tweet is from Melissa Hartman. She's saying she's grateful to Representative Esther Agbaje, who represents North Minneapolis, and Senator Hartman, who represents the same Senate district uh, that she's a part of. And her note is that prohibiting hair discrimination is another step towards building a stronger, more inclusive Minnesota. Well, the other thing, uh, speaking of what's you know uh, buzzing now in social media, is uh, we need to pay attention to what's happening with Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar uh, is the subject of a guest essay in today's New York Times, uh, the January, actually yesterday's. It's a, it's a four minute read, I'll read part of it, but the headline says, when Ilhan Omar asks questions of her when Ilhan Omar asks questions, her colleagues should listen. That's the headline. When Ilhan Omar asks questions, her colleagues should listen. And that is an opinion piece by Peter Beinart. P Beinart is a journalist and commentator who frequently writes about American foreign policy. Uh, I'll read several paragraphs of it. And the reason is uh, Ilhan is a, a, a wave maker. She's setting uh, uh, new, charting new territory for awareness, engagement, for balance, and for equity and honesty uh, in our interaction between ourselves here in this country and with the rest of the world. So uh, this article says that 
House Republicans are poised to make a grave mistake by removing from the Committee on Foreign Affairs the only person who consistently describes American policy, American foreign policy, as it is experienced by much of the rest of the world. Those behind the effort to remove Ilhan Omar claim that she's bigoted against Jews, her Democratic defenders counter that the real bigots are those Republicans seeking to oust a black Muslim woman. Yet, neither side is talking much about what Omar has actually done on the committee from which she may soon be removed. That's too bad, because what Omar has done is extraordinary. In 2021, the Alliance of of Democracies Foundation asked 50,000 people in 53 countries which global power they thought most threatened democracy in their nation. The United States came in first. Judging by their public statements, most members of the House Public Affairs Committee think that these non-Americans are certifiably insane. The committees, Republicans and Democrats, both largely take it for granted that the United States, despite occasional blunders, defends liberty when discussing threats to human rights. They generally attribute those to America's foes. Uh, Ilhan is the exception. Uh, Last paragraph I'll read, consider what transpired at a hearing last April about American strategy in Asia. Uh, Michael McCall, a Republican who is now the committee's chairman, declared that, quote, Americans' legacy in the Indo-Pacific is freedom and prosperity, close quote, and then warned that China's Communist Party threatens it. Ted Deutsch, a Democrat, told the witness, Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, that it was a premise that I think we all share, that human rights needs to be front and center in our foreign policy. Having applauded the Biden the Biden administration and his fellow committee members for their devotion to human rights, uh, Mr. Deutsch asked about China's representation. Uh, uh, and hold on here. Uh, and repression in Xinjiang and its arms sales to the Middle East. Well, it goes on. What's the point? The point is that Omar, uh, well, I'll read one more paragraph. So when Miss Omar's turn came, the self-congratulatory abruptly, the self-congratulation abruptly stopped. She began by noting that during America's last Cold War, the country supported brutal dictators like Chile's Augusto, Augusto Pinochet and Indonesia Suharto because they shared a common enemy. Then she asked Ms. Sherman why her administration was making Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India our new Pinochet. Uh, Ms. Omar, Omar's colleagues discussed India primarily as a potential bulwark against China and Russia. Only Omar spoke about American complicity in the repression of minority groups in India. Well, there we go. There we go. So Ilhan speaks out. She speaks forcefully. She speaks truth to power. And we owe it uh, to ourselves and to her to continue to support her, to write letters, to make phone calls to uh, the Republican leadership, to our own leaders, telling them that we support Ilhan Omar, that she should remain on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. And uh, again, uh, we want to thank you, our listeners here at KFAI, and those joining us on social media from around the several platforms that we are on. Uh, Thank you for being part of this program. Let me bring in my guest today, uh, a friend and uh, a delightful human being, Reverend William Pierce. Uh, Brother Pierce, good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation. How you doing, man? I'm fine. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So let me start by uh, letting you invite our viewers and our listeners to this wonderful uh, celebration for Black History Month, celebration of the sound of gospel. Talk about it. Yes. Yeah, we want to invite you out to a wonderful production. Um, it's a uh, musical, uh, more uh, say, and we are we are so glad and excited that Javita Steele is our our production director, Billy Steele is our uh, music director, 
we're going to have a wonderful time talking about the anthology or the, the history of gospel music. And uh, you, you don't want to miss the show uh, Saturday, uh, February the 5th at 7 p.m. and Sunday, uh, February the 5th. Um, fourth uh, on Saturday and, and February the 5th on Sunday at 3 p.m. Uh, at North Central uh, 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 University, downtown Minneapolis. So what will people see when they come to the shows on, on uh, this weekend? Yes, uh, this weekend we're going to go all the way back uh, uh, to uh, when we were brought over as slaves from Africa working in the field. So we're gonna see that transitioning of the drums that, you know, when, when everything started with the beats of the drum, because, you know, of, of African descent, we have that that music uh, in us, it's still in us from that beat, the drum beat. So we're gonna see that, we're gonna see then, we're gonna see um, uh, how we're going to uh, portray the songs from the fields called those work songs. We're gonna see those work songs, we're gonna see uh, the, the work song, field songs. We're gonna see uh, those uh, Dr. Watts, they call, and we'll talk a little more about that, Dr. Watts. We're going to see the transition up to the choir, the quartets, all those things. We're going to have a little uh, excerpt from those those uh, uh, history, uh, historical moments about gospel music and how we got music today. How do we arrive to the music we hear today? All going all the way back to the field and uh, the slaves when they were in the, uh, the fields as slaves. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. My guest is Reverend William Pierce. He's producing The uh, the Sound of Gospel, a musical takes place this weekend. And over the course of the next few minutes, we're going to remind you again and again, because we want you to come out on February 4th and 5th. Is that correct, Bill? 4th and 5th? To, 4th and 5th. To enjoy the program downtown Minneapolis at North Central University. And we'll keep reminding you that of that we think it's important i think we've got a clip that we can share and uh, for the radio audience you can hear this it's wonderful but uh, for those who are watching online you can see it as well radio people simply use your powerful mind's eye and <laughs> visualize uh, yes. what we're enjoying visually uh, let's play that clip and then we'll come back and talk more about it You know, uh, you can't get enough of a good gospel music, but I want uh, you and I, uh, Reverend Pierce, to kind of uh, dissect or go into what we just heard. Uh, who was it, first of all? What was it called? And how how you, how you describe that element of the gospel music? Uh, and it's it's not just music. It is music, but it's bigger than that. From my point of view, let's talk about that. Who was that? Yeah, artist name is Jermaine. He's actually uh, singing one of the quartet groups uh, here in the Twin City. And what we just heard was, as I mentioned earlier, it's called a Dr. Watts hymn. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that the Dr. Watts come from uh, an individual named Dr. Watts, but he was white. What is W A T T? Yeah, white. Dr. Watts. W A T T S. Watts. Okay. okay. Yeah, Dr. Watts. And uh, uh, he, he actually, he, he's like the father of the hymns, the hymn books that we, 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 we actually sing from. Mm -hmm. However, what we did as African-American slaves, we took those hymns, and not only from the, his hymn, uh, hymnals, but we took those hymns from those books and we called, started 
singing what he called lining. So someone would sing the song, start the song out, and if someone else would come back and repeat what they just said, a song. So that's called Dr. Watts. That's where we get the, that's Dr. Watts from. And each church sung them differently, mm -hmm. but it's from the South, and that's what it originated from. And, and the practice is called lining? Lining. So what does yes. that mean? Let me go into that some more. So for instance, like if I say, I heard the Lord, he heard my cry. So I that's line, I lined it out. I, I, I kind of lined that out. So you would repeat that. Mm -hmm. But in a different way, the uh, harmonious, it, it was like you you would have these pitches go up and down. And it's like it was actually, it was uh, indicating the pain or the, the joy. And so it was so many emotional in, uh, in these songs, combined in these songs, that it, 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 it kind of moved people. Mm -hmm. So right now, that was song during a devotional time during, during church service. And some of the older churches to hold on to tradition, you hear those songs on during, uh, during those devotional time of the church service, which begin the service. So you begin the service, it, it kind of ushers you into <laughs> the service of worship time. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, it reminds me that this must be the method by which we retain our African understanding of the interconnectedness of everything, that uh, as culture, though the uh, pressure of bondage and enslavement yes. sought to destroy our sense of self, there was an indwelling uh, capacity, capability that survived and meant that we could be resilient and resistant at the same time and emerge out of this massive uh, centuries of oppression, uh, richer, stronger, uh, and uh, purer uh, as a um, an expression of what human beings could be, strengthened exactly. by uh, the uh, experience of being in the cauldron, uh, in the fire, uh, in the lion's den, all any way you want to describe it, right? But we've yes. been through that as uh, enslaved it. people, uh, as uh, people that were colonized. Uh, thanks, uh, Brother Powers, for saying good afternoon uh, to us, brothers and sisters. He's greeting us from New Orleans, Louisiana. And if you're anywhere else around the world and listening to this program and watching it, we want to hear from you. Shout out uh, your name and where you're from. And if you've got a comment, uh, reach us on one of the channels and drop the comment. We want to hear from you. Thank you, uh, Brother Powers96. So this music... Uh, what I said, uh, Brother Pierce, Reverend Pierce, was that certainly it's music and certainly it's beautiful, but in my estimation, it's bigger than music. Yes. It's more it than music. It is. And I'm trying to find the right words to elevate what it is uh, that can properly capture or describe. And I think that it's so big that no words are adequate uh, to describe <laughs> the purpose and the power, uh, the breadth and the depth of the experience that occurs when uh, our people are both uh, uh, delivering and being delivered by uh, this experience I in song that. and in praise. Am I on the right track? Yeah, I, I love what you just said, uh, delivering and being delivered by, because the, if I could put it in word words, gospel music, is an expression. <laughs> it's an expression of the horrendous tradition that we were endured and overcame, but it's the way we express ourselves in music. Uh, okay, we didn't have uh, 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 Al McFarland. <laughs> they could could actually, you know, we could come and, and share our thoughts and, and get the word out about what's going on in the community. So we had to use songs to uh, send codes, to uh, express what we were dealing with, to uh, send a message here to tell people that this, this, you know, heaven, you know, we were trying to reach heaven, you know what I'm saying? We, we would send a message to everybody said, look, we're going to get there one day. So it was a way to express ourselves through gospel music. And even today, you know, it's still, is, it's, a, it's a form of expression. We express ourselves through music. So I love what you said, delivering and being delivered by, we are continuously being delivered by the music we sing because the songs we sing indicates the deliverance we are at being delivered through. I want to, yes, mean uh, producer, uh, 
I would like to uh, play this song again in a few minutes uh, just to hear it again. And uh, I think maybe turn the volume up on it this time because I want to get into it again. You know, right. and I, uh, I, I want to sit in the feeling of it because I heard you, uh, Reverend, uh, talk about um, how in, in the process of lining, uh, one person will, will lay out the song but another person might come and do it differently. It reminds me of how uh, the improvisational nature of jazz, which came out of this same tradition. Right, ragtime. Where so you say- ragtime, Yeah. You know, so ragtime came before jazz. Yep. <laughs> so ragtime, you know, well, like we get the dance and the big bop type of dancing. So yep. all that was was influenced or influenced each other, jazz, mm -hmm. gospel. So yes, you, you go ahead with your thought. The tradition, well, the thinking, you know, when I listen to, to Coltrane, Coltrane takes one line and he'll play it from top to bottom, from bottom to top, from left to right, to right to left, to diagonally this way, diagonally the other way. And simply it's one seed of an idea that has a, uh, uh, a thousand pathways, each of which is valid, right? Each of yes. one is rich, each of which is rich, and each of which um, reflects the power of transformation, of transportation to uh, another place, another experience. Let's listen again. We'll come back and talk, talk about it. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, go ahead and play it again. Oh, here's a different piece, right? Okay. Around the country today. <laughs> McFarland, you're listening to the conversation with Al McFarland, my guest, the Reverend William Pierce. He's producing a show that you don't want to miss. It's happening this weekend, February 4th and 5th at North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. The show uh, is uh, all about gospel music. Reverend Pierce, uh, let's go over that piece we just heard again. We heard it once at the opening, but I asked uh, to play it again because I wanted to sit in it for a minute to, to experience and to feel uh, the energy and the power. And that's exactly what it delivered again. Uh, yes. So talk more about that, just uh, that particular. So when, when that's happening, here's what my experience has been. And it's in gospel, but in a lot of music, maybe it's in all music, uh, as the artists are able to uh, hone in on the central idea, the feeling, the thought, they experience a transformation. And at one level, they are witnessing something happen just as it's happening through them. And we call it the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or the Spirit. Talk about that. So, so and you talk about transforming. Uh, gospel music, I believe, is so transforming. So here it is. As we sat and listened to that, we actually became a part of the song. And not only the song, but the experience the individual was experiencing when they sung the song. So you have a group of people. So the deacon, most likely the deacon would, would, would line that out. And the whole church would repeat that. So whatever the deacon was going through, and let's, let's, let's think about this. Whatever the deacon was experienced throughout the week, whatever hardship, whatever pain, whatever suffering, whatever challenging, now the congregation can feel that through the song and the words that he's expressing. You know what I'm saying? I, heard, I, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Okay? 
And so now the, the church is singing, and only not only singing it, it only experience what the deacon just just uh, experienced, but they also expressing their experience in the way they sing this song. You know, saying, "I love the Lord, heard my cry, and pitied every groan." As long as I live and trouble rise, I hasten to his throne. It's poetry and song. So we are actually able to connect with each other's experiences and express our own experiences while experiencing the other person's experiences. It's transforming. So go ahead. Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Let's remind people again of the event and what they need to do to connect and be a part of it this weekend. Yeah, so uh, the sound of gospel, when we say the sound of gospel, the gospel music has many different sounds. It's going it's going to be Saturday, uh, uh, February the 4th, and Sunday at, at 7 o'clock, and then Sunday, uh, February the 5th at 3 p.m. at North Central University. Uh, if, if you know, for more information, you can call 952-567-3986. You don't want to miss this show. It's not only going to be transforming education, it's going to be inspiring and uplifting. Uh, we have a lot of young people coming for the first time. Oh my, it, this is exciting. When you have young people want to not only know about the history, but experience the history of gospel music. Because gospel music is an integral part of the history of African Americans. Mm -hmm. What's your own story, uh, Reverend Pierce? How have you come to uh, the ministry? Uh, where are you from? And uh, I'm originally from Mississippi. Of course, that's what I, I mean, gospel music in Mississippi is like the, the, the central, the, the it's the foundation, if you will, of gospel music around those the southern states. So I'm originally from Mississippi. I moved what, here. What town? What town are you from? A place called Salis, Mississippi. Uh, not far from the Delta, where you have, the, of course, the the uh, uh, the creation of the blues and, and all those things. So, uh, and not only from uh, close to the Delta, but Kosciuszko. That's where Oprah Winfrey from. Mm -hmm. About ten miles from uh, Kosciuszko. Yeah. So I, I came I, to I, Minnesota. In I have a relative there. Uh, just an aside, my wife's family is from Crystal Springs, Mississippi. Crystal Springs. Which is just south of uh, uh, Jackson, about 20 minutes or so on Highway 55. I don't know if you know the area. Oh, but yes. I mean, actually, 45 minutes. We are, I live about 15 minutes from uh, Highway 55. Okay. Okay. And then my mother's side of the family is from Sunflower. Uh, Sunflower. Up in, up yes. in the uh, Delta. I know and where so that is as well. We came out of, on my family's, my mother's side anyway, came out of uh, the fields, uh, sharecropping. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, like most black families did, well, we all did. We were all part of the uh, slave economy and the cotton economy yes. in the South. So that's our, my legacy on my mom's side. Yeah, so my dad, my dad was a singer. Uh, uh, and my grandmother, the whole family, uh, his, 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 his mother, uh, his aunts, they all sang. Mm -hmm. So it was there was a, it was about six girls and, and one boy, but the, the at that time my dad's uncle didn't sing, but all of them sang around Mississippi and they were all known. Uh, the Pierce family and my dad was a phenomenal singer. I I, I didn't get that gene, so <laughs> I can say but as well as my dad. So, you sounded pretty good to me when you did that piece a minute ago, but go ahead. <laughs> so it's in me. Uh -huh. Music I, I grew up uh with Jackson Southern Airs, uh, Mighty Clouds of joy. So I grew up, I mean, that's all we heard was uh, blues, R&B, and gospel music. So I have been inundated with that music. And so when I came here, I always, you know, was around music. I've been in music groups. I, I actually have uh, managed some groups. So I just wanted to share a history with people. Uh, it's been about four, probably about seven years ago, I wrote this piece mm -hmm. because I felt that we as a people need to understand where did this music come from? We cannot cover all the historical aspect of this music in this time frame, but we can give you a glimpse of what this music, we're gonna cover all genre of gospel music, the urban gospel, traditional gospel, you know? So we're gonna to touch on all the quartets, choirs, all those things derived from slaves. And we, so I, I felt, I had an urge, I had a desire, a burning desire to share what God had placed in me and, and, and written for him and on stage in a way that people can receive it, accept it, and be inspired by it. So that's where all this came from. But it, it, it originated and started from being a part of this music growing up in Mississippi. Well, I'm going to ask you to go uh, deeper into that. I, I'd love to hear uh, you know, how you describe your grandfather and the relatives that you knew 
as a young person growing up who were in the music. The, you said your grandfather was a singer and your father? Oh, my, my dad. Your my dad. dad. Tell, yeah. tell, tell me about him, about your dad. Uh, what's his name? And Floyd, Floyd Pierce. How, how did he become a singer? And what did that mean to be a singer? And what did he do for a living? I mean, were they right. one and the same? Or did he no, work No, no, it's not. Uh, actually, my dad was a farmer. And mm -hmm. uh, he was not a singer uh, majority of life. Uh, uh, he got in a car accident. <laughs> and from that time on, he dedicated his life. And I think my sister, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm dating myself. My sister's one year older than me. So my sister were, was a baby at the time. So it was 50 some years ago. Um, so he, he got in a car accident and he started singing. So as far as I know, all I knew my dad as far as singing was gospel music. Mm -hmm. Riding in the car, he was singing. And he, I said, when I say phenomenal singer, he was a phenomenal singer. He had so much passion behind mm -hmm. the singing. So mm -hmm. he was all type of requests on Mississippi. Everywhere we went, Floyd Pierce come and sing. They, when I go to Mississippi now, they want me to sing, but I can't sing like him. <laughs> so I grew up around that. And my grandmother, uh, my, my, my aunts, so we went to different churches. Mississippi is not like it. And up north where you go to the same church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So every Sunday you went to a different church. So let me give you an example. My 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 aunt, uh, she would sing "Precious Lord," and mm -hmm. so they were singing the slow version. So then she would come out, oh, talking about praise and grace, oh, amazing grace, how sweet. So that like, she, she was just break out in that. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother has a song that I used to, I love to hear her sing, and it was like, "Get right, church, let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home." Get right, church, and let's go home. She so she's saying that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and her favorite verse was back, back, train and get your load. So I grew up around this music. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it inspired me and encouraged me. So when I go through trials, when, I, when I'm faced with certain uh, challenges in my life, those songs that I heard growing up encouraged me, empowered mm -hmm. me to continue on because that's the same thing it did for my, for my father, the same thing it did for my grandmother and their, their uh, grandmother and uh, mothers and stuff that, you know, before them. I'm Al McFarland, and you're listening to The Conversation with Al McFarland. My guest is the Reverend William Pierce, and he's producing and presenting this year's version of his production, uh, The Sound of Gospel. It's a phenomenal concert being presented Saturday and Sunday, February 4th and 5th at North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. You don't want to miss it. We're going to give you information uh, as to where you can connect and get tickets before the show is over. But uh, take notes or get your pencil ready uh, to find out and how to show up and be there and to get the blessing, uh, to get the experience, the benefit, the gift uh, that this music, that this expression provides uh, all who uh, uh, are touched by it. Uh, and then let's talk about that. So what happens with when people in audiences, with your audiences for this production in particular, but use that as a, uh, a method to discuss the relationship. And you mentioned it earlier, but the relationship between the musician, the song and the audiences present. I'll say start with that. But I think you and I probably both grew up listening to the radio. Yes. And hearing this gospel music on the radio, and we have an idea of the power of the music even over the air. That's what I think. You right. tell me what you think. Well, I, there's no question. Uh, when you think about gospel music, we talk about the drum, the the, the, the beat. So we as African American became instruments before we had instruments. So we were, you know, clap our feet, you know, pat our hands, and so our voice, you know, was was the way we express ourselves, and then. Then it so happened we brought music into this. So now we have the music and the songs so combined together. So one thing that the audience would, would experience is the, again, not only the feeling and expression from the songs, but the union. You would be able to come together and be able, and actually feel what the other person is, is, is experiencing or singing about doing that experience. So when they talk about the feel songs and they talk about the work song, you're actually going to uh, be able to come and, and, and go into the experience with that individual as they sing it, and your mind would take you back what it was like as for those slaves as they were singing those songs. When we go talk about the 1930s and when you talk about Thomas Dorsey and Mahalia Jackson, precious Lord, you know, so Thomas Dorsey was a, like a blues kind of player, you know, the way he played, 
and people, the church rejected him. Mm -hmm. When he first, you know, actually introduced this type of music, really, he's like the father of gospel music. Yep. And so, so to understand what what this transition have gone through, you will be able to experience it and and actually be a part of it, and you will go through it with the song, with the singers, and the narrations that they dance, the dancing. So we have some dancing, we have the narration. Actually, the the, the actors will be narrating their own parts, and then be singing out those parts. So we're going to experience some, some educational stuff. We're going to experience some music. We're going to experience some dancing. You're going to get all that when you see this show. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. Uh, thanks, Power96. Uh, thank you for your notes, your commentary. Really appreciate <clears throat> what you're saying. And uh, invite other listeners and viewers to chime in as well. Uh, we are grateful that you are a part of this conversation with us here. You know, <clears throat> Brother Pierce, um, uh, I wanted to go back, <clears throat> and I threw out the term, uh, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Yes. And I wanted you to, to address that because I think you and I know what we're talking about, but other people might not. And uh, I believe that that when, you know, so we can call them performers for the sake of the public. Right. But the singers don't see themselves as performers, I don't believe, when they are genuinely in the spirit, in the moment, in the movement, and in uh, almost in glory. Uh, they really are vessels, conduits, agents of the creator of the ancestors and of the truth. And what they are delivering is a quickening or a alive energy. You described it. I hadn't heard it described that, that way before. You described it as the ability to know what the other person is experiencing and feeling. And if you multiply that uh, among a bunch of people, something powerful is going down, is yes. what I think. And I've been in, uh, obviously, church situations where people are overcome, overwhelmed, transformed, uh, moved. And it's almost like the whole building changes. You come in one way, you leave a different way. Yes. Talk about that. Well, you know, when you, as you was talking, I was thinking about musicians such as B.B. Uh, King, um, you know, even Prince, you know, those great musicians where if you close your eyes and they were playing an instrument, uh, for instance, like a guitar, you close your eyes, you hear the guitar being played. You don't see the individual, but you hear the music, the, the actual instrument. Mm -hmm. So you talk about being a vessel. So those singers are instruments being played, if you will, by God. Mm -hmm. So we're actually hearing them. They are they are, they are have surrender and submit themselves to God and being played in a way their the songs are like music, and they are actually uh, expressing themselves through that song. And not only are they expressing themselves, but they're expressing what God has given them. So that that experience we get from that. It's, it's unexplainable. So the Holy Spirit takes over, if you will, during that time. And so what, what they are singing now comes over me. And I'm able not only to connect with them, but I'm able to now experience something that I'm going through. And that's that same thing that inspired them to sing it inspires me, encouraged me to go on a little while longer. As the song I said, I, I believe I can go on a little while longer. I feel like going on. And those songs helps me give me a feeling through the power of this Holy Spirit to go on, no matter the trial, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, no matter the obstacle. Now I leave this experience. I leave this show coming in one way, maybe down, maybe distraught financially, maybe physically, whatever. And I leave and say, oh, man, I can, I can go on. I can make it another day because of the songs and the, and, and the artists been, been been used by God to sing those songs. The Spirit have not fallen upon me. And now the spirit encouraged me to continue on in spite of the situation. What do you think is the relationship between uh, this music that we have created here in uh, the new world? Uh, we African people uh, have given birth to a, a new idiom, a new expression. Uh, mm -hmm. We call it gospel. We call it jazz. We call it blues. Uh, you know, some say we call it rock and roll. 
uh, all of it foundational and connected to uh, our understanding of the universe uh, before our encounter with the Europeans in the yeah. beginning of the African slave trade. What, what do you see coming through long term? Where, where will this music go in your mind's eye? This is really not a fair question to ask you, but I'm going to ask you. It's not. I'm going to ask you anyway, because <laughs> you're here and it's, I'm here. And, it's uh, not, you it, know. It, I think <laughs> traditional, I mean, a gospel music would always remain true to its roots. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how far we get away from it, we can call it urban, we can call it uh, 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 whatever we want to call it today. The reason we cannot get away from it because it's an expression of our pain and suffering, our endurance, the things we have endured. So no matter how far you try to get away, when you go to write a song, gospel song, your your pain, your suffering, whatever you, 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 you're dealing with, it comes out. So you automatically connect to the, the true root of gospel music and they all go all the way back to Africa. Africa, you know, through the drums, you know, you could hear whatever what the, the tribe was going through, you, you could hear that through that drum. You know, it was it was it was a message coming through those those instruments. So as long as we are still African Americans, gospel music will, will remain true to its roots. So I, that's the best way I can answer. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an unfair well, question, I, I, but they, it will they, remain they true. There's a question because what's happening, you know, you know this too, is gospel music like hip hop music is experiencing a growth all over the planet. Every now yes. and then, brother, I turn on uh, YouTube and I'll see a Tokyo gospel choir. I saw this group from Tokyo once, and apparently some brothers that might've been in the military, that might've been soldiers stationed there that love music and introduced people there to gospel music or radio, or I'm not sure how they got to it, but the music has taken hold in Japan, taking hold in China and different parts of Asia. Uh, the music obviously is popular in Europe, you know, and in other languages as well. But I can tell you how surprised I was when, uh, and I can imagine, you know, the excitement, the joy that this uh, Japanese youth choir had. It was a video a couple of years ago, I was watching it, and they were pulling up on a bus to one of the big churches in Harlem, right? And I mean, yeah, first of all, Harlem as a concept is the center of yeah. black culture in the world, yes. right? And so yeah, can nice. you imagine 40, 50, 100 uh, uh, Japanese, uh, maybe, you know, 15 to 20 year olds, or it could have been some adults and some young adults, but going into a black church in Harlem to sing the gospel, that must have been frightening. Because she's yeah. like, you know, uh, to not maybe know the language, but have learned the language, and then to get into a church where the language, where the gospel originates, where it's organic, right? Where it's part of the, uh, the the breathing of the walls and of the seats and of the floor and all the things that make that building and all the people in it. You walk in there wanting to sing gospel music, which says two things. Number one is that... This music has that power to attract uh, that feeling and that expression, that confession from human beings everywhere. But yes. it also says that it will give you the courage, you know, to go uh, places you never imagined yourself and to present yourself to uh, 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 seek to demonstrate that you are worthy. Right. And that's what that had to be for them to say, I'm here. I don't know English. I'm not African American, but I'm here professing yes. uh, this truth that I feel in my soul in this music. That's happening all around the world. Am I correct? You said actually, you, you just sung a song. The way you just expressed the expression, I feel in my soul. That's gospel music, and you write a gospel music has had a a a huge impact on the world, and so when people. Uh, seeing gospel music, when people hear gospel music again, they are living, reliving what we experienced as African American. And I said, and I said again, said it before, and I said again that as long as we are African American, as long as we continue to suffer in this country, as long as we continue to suffer in this world, there will always be gospel music, and we will always be impacting people because people are learning, continues to learn about the condition or previous condition of African Americans even as slave. So when we look at this music, 
I just can't help but to get excited about the opportunity. And, and I think about what you're doing. And I, I appreciate what you do, uh, Al. I, I appreciate Insight News. It's a medium. It's an avenue that we can express. We can, we can talk about issues. So gospel music is a way that we can express and talk about suffering, talk about things in the world. I mean, civil rights. Just think, just, let's just pick that area. Era. Civil rights. Gospel music helped us get through that time. Yep. Gospel, yeah. the word gospel come from the, 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 the first four books of the Bible. Gospel, the message. So the, the word gospel come from the word message. So all we doing by singing gospel music is delivering a message. Like you deliver a message through the medium you have. Gospel music is the way to deliver a message. Of course, we back in the day in slavery, we had to deliver a message in secret. Mm-hmm. Now we don't have to be no secretive anymore. We can tell people not only about what we are suffering, going through, but also about the word of God, Christ Jesus. And that's the gospel. Let me push you, push you a little bit, uh, brother, uh, Reverend Pierce. So um, you're using the language of expressing the suffering and the pain. And so my question is, and I know you've got an answer for this, is beyond the pain and beyond the suffering, where does this medium take us? What comes to the my joy. mind automatically is the, the, the word joy. I'm yes, leave yes, that's I'm the same thing, joy. Take, take it from there. So even if you if you think about uh, the song we say, I got shoes, you know, way back in the day, you got mm-hmm. shoes, all mm-hmm. got shoes and got shoes. When I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm going to walk around heaven. That's what he said. He said heaven. Mm-hmm. I'm going to walk around heaven all day. Heaven all day. That, in the midst of the suffering, the songs brought joy. Not only brought joy, but brought hope. Mm-hmm. So gospel music, although it, it indicates and illustrates and demonstrates the suffering we have endured, it also, out throughout that, through the Holy Spirit, as you mentioned, it gives the person hope to not only to, to continue on, but that things will get better. You know, you think about the civil rights. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. That's hope. No matter what you do to me, you can't stop me. That's a song I grew up on. I'm on my way to the kingdom land. Nothing you can say to change my mind, nothing you can do to turn me around. I'm on my way to the kingdom land. That's hope in that. Joy, because the joy comes from the hope. If I got hope, I got joy. And see, joy, you know, that that's things that happen on the inside. Don't, it's not required about what's happening around me, but joy is something on the inside. Because it's on the inside, I express it on the outside, and now I'm singing gospel music. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland, my guest, the Reverend William Pierce, producing a show that you don't want to miss. It's happening this weekend, Saturday and Sunday at North Central University in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, And it's a show that's all about the gospel. Uh, It's the sound of gospel, a history, a walk through uh, gospel's beginnings uh, to present, an exploration of all the uh, idioms, all the forms all the uh, variations, the mitigations, or not mitigations, but the the the, um, the evolutions uh, of the experience and how it was expressed uh, in different places. So, <clears throat> Reverend Pierce, uh, take us through in a couple of minutes, maybe four or five of your favorite songs. What songs? You've mentioned them, but maybe either <laughs> sing them or a verse of them or talk about uh, half a dozen pieces that have been anthems in your life, even earlier wow. or today. Wow, that's 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 difficult. It's been so many songs that inspired me. Uh, a song that my dad uh, sang is uh, When the Gay Swing Open, I'll Walk In. Uh, that sounds means so much, not only because my dad sang that song, and of course, uh, uh, I think Sam Cook's on that song as well. Um, that song resonates so much because I think about my dad's now uh, deceased and gone on to be with God, that w- the gates one day going to swing open for me and I'm going to walk in. And a part of that song, is, it talks about one of the verses. There are people who, your friends, you know, are few. 
and talks about how God lifts you up. And my dad sang another song that when Jesus, when, when, when you press me down, Jesus picks me up. He stand by my side when the going gets tough. I got Jesus and that's enough. Listen, I don't care what you, you're dealing with, what you're going through. There are going to be times in your life you feel like everyone has forsaken you. But if you remember that Jesus is by your side, that's all that matters. So that's, that's, that's a couple of songs. And of course, A Precious Lord, Take My Hand. That's, that's another favorite song of mine. Was that uh, Dorsey's song? Yes. Yes, that's Dorsey. Thomas, Tommy, Tommy Dorsey. Mm -hmm. You know, that song. And so, uh, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I mean, because of those songs, all the songs I mentioned is talk about you needing help because of the world situation, because of the people in the world. Majority of the songs, if not all, the songs that I can mention to you, it's an encouraging song. Songs about hope, songs about uplifting and, and, and inspiring you to continue on. And one of the songs that I, you know, I, I think come from the five heartbeat, I feel like going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's time when you don't feel like going on, mm -hmm. but I feel like going on. And so I, I love that. I love those songs, uh, the songs that my, my grandmother sang. I, I mentioned some of those songs, you know, uh, Get Right Church, Let's Go Home. Uh, uh, talk about Amazing Grace. Of course, you know that the, the writer of that song was a, a, a owner of a, say, a slave ship. Of course, we know that. But Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound to save a rest like me. So there's so many songs and I can, when I preach, when I teach, songs come out. When I'm writing a play, songs come out because the songs fit the moment. Mm. The songs fit the mood. You know, I, I of course, I love the, the Dr. Watts. You know, I love the Lord, he hurt my cry. You know, uh, there's a man by the river giving sight to the blind. You know, it's talking about Jesus. These are like poetry talking about who Jesus is. And there's so many, so many songs that I, I've, uh, I've heard and, 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 and tried to emulate. My dad sang another song said that uh, I'm sending up my timber. This song here, so it's, when I say timber, people don't know what that means. That means I'm sending up some, I'm sending my work. Mm -hmm. I'm sending up my timber every day. In other words, what he's saying is that the life I live, I'm sending up, sending up timber to God to build a mansion for me. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that song there, my, the way my dad sing it, if, if you could hear him sing that song, there's a dream that I dream of, of a heavenly home, that one day I'm going, soon one day. <laughs> so that song itself let me know that no matter what I deal with down here, that this life is not the end. That's, I, have to, I have to keep moving. I have to keep going. I have to keep, keep doing good work. I have to keep loving. I have to keep... You know, doing these shows so that I can keep, you know, inspiring people because God gonna say, "What did you do for me when I get to heaven?" Mm -hmm. I'm saying, I, I sent them my timber. Where's my mansion? I want to get to my mansion right now. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some of the songs I, I can list. So many songs because there's so many songs that inspired me, uh, not only growing up as a as a young boy, but even to this day. You know, some of the Tommy Dorsey songs, some of the, you know, the, uh, uh, like I said, the uh, Jackson Southern Airs, the, uh, uh, the. Pilgrim Jubilees, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, um, Mighty Clouds of Joy. All those songs I grew up on, the quartet songs. Mm -hmm. I, uh, <clears throat> uh, who, who are the, uh, the leading voices in the music today that you could name uh, new people? You mentioned earlier that young people are flocking back to the music because there right. was this thought that um, church itself and, you know, the gospel and everything associated uh, with it was of decreasing importance to young people. But what you said, and what I think is true, is that uh, everything is ebb and flow, and where we are now is at a point where young people are finding a need to connect, to be, uh, be with each other in a space that is uh, uplifting, that's positive, that's uh, action-oriented, that allows them to be young, but also to be uh, focused on work and focused on joy and focused on being responsible and to not have to be uh, captured by and controlled by uh, images and stories and narratives that depict them as defective and deficient, that they are finding ways to 
uh, uh, to reflect and, and reveal and walk in uh, their own glory, their own truth, and their own potential and their power. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes, and, and we have a, a, a new group of gospel artists, if you will, that's uh, kind of you know, taken over the scene. Uh, you know, we have uh, some of the older artists, they, they, they transition out or they, they are moving on or are dying out. So we have, a, a, I think it's Alexis, it's a Spite is her name, uh, Jacqueline Carr, Jonathan McReynolds, uh, people like, uh, uh, is that I think the Nietzsche more those are like the voices of gospel music now and we talk about the urban gospel is more uh some of those people stay true to the roots you know they still singing uh, those old songs but think about it I don't care what song they sing but they come to you know a lot of those individuals I brought to Minnesota or, or had on tour somewhere I don't care how to how non-traditional their gospel music is or how urban the music is or how hip-hop it is they're going to sing a song or two or three of that traditional gospel music. You got to go back to the roots. You have to. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that no matter how far we get away from it, we still have to go back to those roots. Where do people find you regularly, uh, Reverend Pierce, uh, uh, beyond the, the, the concert? How do they connect with you and uh, follow your work and uh, participate? A second chance. Outreach.org is my website. Second Chance, that's 2ND. Second Chance Outreach.org is my website. Uh, uh, my email address is same thing, uh, Second Chance Outreach 2012 at gmail.com. That's 2ND. Second Chance Outreach 2012 at gmail.com. Or my personal phone number, 952 567 3986. 952 Five six seven three nine eight six. And talk about Second Chance Outreach. What's the vision? Oh my, oh my God! What's Second the vision? Chance. And what's the mission? We got about four minutes. Second Chance. I, I, I Second Chance Outreach Community Organization was established in 2012. Of course, I it was birthed out of Second Chance Productions. It was a a for profit. The Second Chance Outreach is a not for profit organization. And I'm glad you asked the question because our perspective. Our desire is to create an avenue not only to provide entertainment, okay, but our primary focus is to create opportunities to educate, inspire, encourage, and motivate our surrounding communities. We, this even during this event, we're not just talking about Black history. We're talking about Black people. <laughs> what can we do? And that's, that's our primary goal, to bridge that financial and uh, educational gap or healthcare gap, if you will. We have an issue financially, economically in our community and our healthcare. So we want to have our sponsors there. We want to have individuals talk about all our issues as, as, as African-American people. If it's diabetes, if it's heart disease, uh, if it's cancer, we want to have some information there. Our primary focus this time is going to be on colon cancer. My mother passed a colon cancer last year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have information there about colon cancer. What can you do in the maintenance? And also, we, we help individuals. We help you with your resume. We help you find jobs in the healthcare field and, and, and the uh, uh, banking system. We want not only talk about these issues, we want to bring something tangible and Listen, help you. We're out of time. This has been a great conversation, Reverend William Pierce. Uh, the Sound of Gospel, this Friday and Saturday. Check it out. I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.